chance to remember why we have an NMC. The NMC is a very special organization in my way of thinking. It's an organization that not only values innovation, but actually practices it each and every day. It's an organization that when we come together, not only do we learn from each other, but we go home with a wealth of ideas that makes things happen and changes education. This is a conference of people that really make a difference. And this afternoon, we're gonna celebrate that in some very significant ways. We're gonna recognize some institutions that are doing that at an extraordinarily level. And the fact is, is that we recognize these institutions not because they're particularly extraordinary, because the fact is, is that each and every one of your institutions could receive this award, and over time you probably will. <laughs> because what we want to do is to take a moment to say, wow, what cool work is going on at this particular college, university, museum, what have you. From time to time, we also take a moment to recognize an extraordinary individual. We don't get to do this every year, but this year, we do. And so it's gonna be kind of an interesting time to do that. And those are kind of serious moments because it feels you know, weighty when you talk about someone's lifetime career and their achievements or, or at the institutional level. And then we balance that with you know, the fun of five minutes and fame of projects, and we got the gong out here, and it's all lit up and everything. And so we'll balance that. And that, that's the spirit of the NMC, where we balance our seriousness with fun. And so, you know, we were all I day we'll yesterday. I hope you'll go along with this rather unusual setting. And <laughs> See what I'm talking about? <laughs> you never know what's going to happen in an organization like this. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's what we're going to do today. Now, I'd like to start off by recognizing one of our founding partners, uh, Adobe Systems. Adobe Systems has gone through some interesting transitions in the last year. And uh, so, if I might, let me, uh, let me bring up Peggy Snyder. Peggy Snyder is a member of the NMC's Board of Directors, and uh, let her talk to you a little bit, Peggy. Thanks, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here. Thrilled also to be a sponsor of this event. I, um, I guess we enjoyed being a sponsor of last night's event also. And it seems that everyone had a good time, right? Yeah. I'm not sure how we're going to top that next year. It's going to be tough. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity again to thank all of you for your support of Adobe's technology and talk a little bit about innovation, creativity, and communication. So that's kind of ties right into Adobe's world I mean, when it comes to creativity. Um, we, we definitely work hard to make it easy for everyone to be creative. If you know our products, it's not always easy. For me, it's um, really you're only limited, you know, by your imagination when it comes to using Adobe products, which is my limitation. So I'm thrilled to always see what all of you do with our products and love to see what the students do with the products. And that's really uh, why we're you know, thrilled to be a part of the NMC, to work with all of you and see what you're working on, but also to look at you know, the creativity, the innovation, which really the video that I'm gonna show kind of speaks to that. And um, I think it kind of talks to kind of where we wanna fit in and also where we're going and the possibilities. So thank you, and uh, we're gonna hold on to those coupons. We're gonna, I'll be back up later to uh, give you some software. And if we wanna roll that video now. I hope you'll go along with this rather unusual setting and the fact that I remain seated when I get introduced and the fact that I'm going to come to you mostly through this medium here for the rest of the show. And I should tell you that I'm backed up by quite a staff of people between here and Menlo Park, where Stanford Research is located, some 30 miles south of here. And uh, if every one of us does our job well, it'll all go very interesting. We are born into a world of light and dark, sensation and emotion. 
Slowly, we discover where the self ends and everything else begins. As our world expands, awareness develops. As our awareness expands, the desire to communicate grows. Nuances are understood, but remain difficult to convey. Tools help us interact. The birth of the mouse was in 1963. Built it on a, in a clunky wooden box about three inches by two inches by two inches. Douglas Engelbart wants to augment human capability, not replace it. I was interested in collaboration. Really trying seriously to find out how to harness computers working interactively with a human to boost the human's intellectual capability. These big complex challenges have to be dealt with collectively. The big problems are getting more urgent and if we don't get collectively smarter, humanity is on a higher and higher probability of crashing. How do humans use the knowledge that we have to solve the problems that we've created for ourselves? The invention of the printing press unlocked information from the libraries of the monasteries and other places where books were hidden at the time and made them generally available to the public. That had a profound effect in terms of political, economic, and educational change during the Renaissance period and after. In the very early days, computers were viewed primarily as engines to do calculations. There was a group at MIT and a group at the Stanford Research Institute who really began to look at computers as ways to communicate as opposed to calculate. Back when John and I started Adobe Systems in 1982, we had an instinctive feeling that electronic communication would eventually become ubiquitous. We'd like to believe that the introduction of PostScript technology that made everyone have the capacity to be a publisher and a printer took that one step further and caused an explosion of the distribution of information that the original inventors of the printing press would never have thought possible. The most remarkable and important thing about media today is its ubiquity. It's invaded every space of our lives, but information is surprisingly hard to acquire. Between you and information is a tremendous amount of, of noise or static. Therefore, when people talk about information overload, I think what they're referring to is the way in which media gets in the way of information. Today, there's unprecedented opportunity to, to create, to communicate. But at the same time, the redundancy that burdens people when they consume media also burdens people when they create media. They become a blog that you haven't updated or a Facebook page that has been out of date since the moment you created it. The notion of electronic communication solving the problems of communication I think is demonstrably false. Instead, what we have is an utterly human process of continuous breakdown. That's what makes it exciting. Cell phones have become ubiquitous. Martin Cooper invented them. People are mobile. They're fundamentally, inherently, naturally mobile. They don't want to be stuck in their cars. They don't want to be leashed to their desks. They don't want to be mired in their homes. They want the ability to communicate wherever they are. For over a hundred years, we in the telecommunications business have told people the way to communicate is to hook yourself up to a wire that's plugged into the wall. Today, it's not unusual to see people on the street playing a game, taking a picture, making a movie, or watching TV on their cell phones. What about the phone call in the future? Is it going to change? Well, of course it will. You'll not only talk to somebody, but you'll see them. 
you'll be able to capture every nuance of expression, both in their hands, their eyes, their facial muscles, and that's gonna make a profound difference in how you can understand what other people have to say. Who we are, what we do, what tools we use, and how we use them is always evolving. The better you get, the better you're gonna get at getting better. I think the thing that's fabulous about the internet is it opens up a whole new form of medium in which, in fact, interactivity is encouraged. Who truly needs information turned around in, say, faster than 24-hour segments? Hello, Joel. It's Marty Cooper. I didn't even know who invented the mouse or the cell phone until this video, so. Uh, it just kind of explains kind of the possibilities and that's why I'm excited about this particular portion of the conference because we get to see how innovative all of you've become and continue to be. And um, Larry, let's get started. Thank you. And so the image behind me is a photograph of the 2006 Center of Excellence Award. The Center of Excellence Awards are symbolic of the institutions themselves. When the awards are created, the molds are broken. In fact, they're broken twice. They're broken once when the medallions that are suspended inside are created, and they're broken again when the acrylic in which they're suspended or created. The first honoree, unusual, because we've never done this before, but in this particular case, we decided to go ahead and do it this year because this is the year when it makes sense to do it. Because there has rarely been an institution that has done so much to bring its community into the information age. With the One Cleveland Project, Case Western University has linked government, education, healthcare, institutions across the city and the county in one of the most forward-thinking and expansive networks that any community has anywhere in the world. But if it was only about fiber optic cables and switches and technology, there wouldn't be a whole lot to talk about because lots of cities have fiber rings and backbones and things like that. But what One Cleveland is about is actually symbolized where we are right here with University Circle, and that's the way I like to think about it. It's a group of institutions that are working together to create a common vision, and Cleveland's like that. And Case Western University, Case Western Reserve, is the leader of that effort, leading all kinds of collaborations in the arts, in the sciences, in medicine, in the humanities, the list is, is amazingly long, and so I'll let them tell their own story. Why don't you go ahead and spin the video for Case Western Reserve, please.
Come on down, folks. I think we have a few Clevelanders here that might uh, come on down to accept this uh, recognition, if we could. While we're while we're getting the the guys in the blue shirts down, how about a little recognition for the fantastic tech support we've been getting at this conference? Huh? This is so thrilling. I am not prepared with a speech or anything, but um, I, whenever I say about NMC, whenever I talk about it, I always say it's my favorite organization. And I know all, look at this, ah, <laughs> I'm so proud. Um, I, we aren't able to have everybody come to the conferences and they were all so excited to be part of it here. This is thrilling. I, I, please, let me give you a hug. There <laughs> This is so fun. <laughs> A few years ago, the NMC made the decision to reach out to new kinds of members. We'd always been, from the very beginning, an organization composed of universities. And then, oh, in the mid-90s, there was a decision to uh, reach out and, and open the doors to some community colleges. But it was always, uh, historically, an organization of primarily higher education institutions. Pretty good ones, by the way, but all focused on higher education. and. Um, Oh, I guess four or five years ago, um, the, the board and, and myself and, and others began to think about that there are certainly some interesting things going on around learning and technology in other kinds of learning organizations. And wouldn't it be cool to have, you know, some, to invite some institutions to be part of the NMC that were not universities? and to see what might happen if we had some like that. <clears throat> and if you looked at a list of NMC members today, you'd see that now we have, oh, about a dozen museums and some nice ones, oh, by the way, including one of the hosts of this conference, the Cleveland Museum of Art. And uh, this, I guess, Lev, or Lynn, this is a good place for the plug. There's a, uh, a nice event tonight at the Museum of Contemporary Art, just two blocks away. We'll tell you more about that at the, at the uh, reception later. Um, but also now Research Center, so Almaden Labs uh, out in uh, San Jose, which is a different way of working with a corporate partner to work with the scientists. Uh, it's kind of an interesting idea to work with the scientists in a, in a corporation. We've reached out to other kinds of uh, research centers. Uh, we, you saw one, one example of how that might play out with the folks that we were working with in Shreveport, Louisiana, who were trying to um, revitalize the music industry there, the fame group. Um, of course, you saw their fun side, but they've got a very, very serious side that is all about new media. And the very beginning of that effort was with one particular institution that has been an extraordinarily strong member of the NMC. A force for good, I have to say. A force that <clears throat> has caused us to really rethink how we look at learning, <clears throat> pardon me, how we look at learning um, in some very, very profound ways. And that institution is the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. The San Francisco Museum of Modern Art was the birthplace of the Pachyderm Project, and they've been collaborators in the most extraordinary way ever since. So if we could go ahead and roll the story of 
at this moment. What am I missing here? It's a hoax. That's not art. Why is it art? I just like the colors. Why do they choose? The forms. Temporary. The colors. Creativity. Art has to grab you. and I'm the head of education and public programs at San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Uh, we've been producing educational content for more than 10 years now and I think it's right to say this is really one of the biggest success stories of this museum in the last decade. The museum's been committed to uh, interpreting modern visual art and culture to a, a broad and diverse audience for a long time now. has been at the core to what we do here, that we try and use the newest technologies in order to frame works of art, describe the context in which they uh, were produced, and make these often quite difficult products of our culture as accessible to as broad an audience as possible. I'm, as the head of department, particularly committed to uh, seeing that the interactive educational technologies team continue to work between 12 and 16 hours a day with the latest technologies producing maybe even four or five features a week and I want to see them continue to work at this pace of, uh, with this, this level of production fueled by as much caffeine and alcohol and other substances that they can lay their hands on. I uh, think this is the future for IET and I wish them well in it. Peter, Tim, those of you who were uh, at the uh, jam session last night might have mistaken Tim for Johnny Cash. <laughs> <laughs> Not much to say except a big thank you to the folks at home on the one hand, the other members of our team who couldn't be here today, and a really big thank you to the guy up there, John Weber, with whom we co-conceptualized this whole program 12 years ago now and uh, it's still going strong. Also, thanks to you, John, so thanks. <laughs> what were you putting in that coffee? <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. They have more fun at their job than I do at mine, I think. <laughs> the last honoree uh, for the Center of Excellence Awards this year has been with the NMC from the beginning. And just has been a part of not only the NMC, but everything that new media is about. And when you think about new media, the University of Michigan has been a part of it in every way, in every dimension, in every kind of expression that it could be, from the big giant platters, the laser discs back in the 1980s and early 90s to the most incredibly cutting edge things that are happening today. Um, the uh, University of Michigan at Ann Arbor has been there, and so let's Let's roll the story and hear, hear what's happening at University of Michigan.
Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure. Uh, thanks for this. Uh, you know, I, I look around, and, and every time I come to a conference, I, um, it's one of the few conferences being you know, kind of a gargantuan university and having reasonable resources and great leadership. Um, oftentimes, I leave a conference like, oh, yeah, I learned a few things. But I leave this conference always envious, OK? There's always a whole bunch of people doing things that we just wish we could do. And that's what really makes it great for us. That, that's what makes it fun. Um, back in 94, when we, we started, there were 21 schools. We sort of got together, looked at each other, wondered whether we could make uh, an old barn into a movie theater or something. And uh, I think Larry had a lot to do with this uh, when, when those changes came about. But this is far more than a, a movie theater at this point, and it's a fantastic experience. I'd just like to uh, thank Carl Berger and Ed Saunders, who had the vision a long time ago um, to get us involved. I'd like to thank countless people back at U of M, uh, my colleagues who couldn't be here today, but Tom Bray in particular, uh, Linda Kendall, Rob Pettigrew, all who have been very involved. Uh, we have a group of 50 who have been involved at various times here and there over the years. And I'd really like to um, thank Adobe, who has had um, you know, a lot of commitment to this organization. And the thing I really want to thank them for is that when I started this, we used 16 colors and had to hand anti-alias our own type. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So a pretty special group of institutions that we can all be proud of that represents us all. Lev's going to join us for this part. Come on up, Lev. The, uh, the NMC board has only twice in its history, this is the second time today, chosen to recognize an extraordinary individual for a lifetime of achievement related to our field of, of new media with a designation known as the NMC Fellow Award. This is it. It's a beautiful award. Again, custom designed, hand struck in bronze, designed to be uh, worn with academic regalia, which we hope the bearer doesn't have many chances to do anymore, but, uh, <laughs> but just in case. And uh, so I'm going to let Lev make the presentation for this one. Wonderful. Uh, as an expression of uh, the highest uh, distinction and uh, award that the NMC provides uh, to the people who make a difference uh, in our world and the world of their campus, this year the uh, Board of Trustees of the NMC uh, are thrilled to be able to bestow this uh, second um, NMC Fellow Award to Dr. Carl Berger. Take a seat for a second, Carl. Uh, this, is, this is our community's way of uh, in truly taking time to celebrate. Uh, I want to just say uh, two uh, personal words about uh, Carl's distinguished career, uh, which extends back well over a quarter of a century in the space that we now call academic technology, and in particular the space of new media. Uh, for me, my involvement in the New Media Consortium, and actually, although I've never shared this with Carl, my whole professional life as it relates to the engagement that I've made professionally in academic technology, goes back to uh, the first time I actually met Carl. Uh, I'd read and I'd heard Carl, but I'd never met Carl until uh, the time that uh, actually back in uh, 1990, I'm going to make a mistake here, 94. Five, uh, that Ann Arbor hosted the NMC meetings. It was the second meeting, actually. 
And um, I was uh, profoundly impacted by the power and the potential of the collaboration of the community. Um, and then I looked for leadership. And in addition to our distinguished colleague, uh, Lewis, who, who shared uh, the stage just a moment ago, it was Carl Berger who provided me with a, with a, a vision, uh, his vision, which I, I took in the most accepted way that we know in our community. I, I stole it uh, and made it my own. And uh, I must say, Carl, um, I know that you've touched not only my professional life, but I know many, many people both in this room and across the country and around the world who, when they think about the pioneering group who actually work together to create what we now know as academic technology in a way that's very relevant to the piece that Peggy showed, the notion that, in fact, computers and IT could be doing more than computation, that could really be about communication, communication among people uh, to address priorities that mattered to them while they were in college or beyond. Uh, that was the vision that Carl Berger had. Um, it is uh, very much a case where, Carl, I hope that you will receive this uh, distinction and this award um, on all of our behalves as an expression of our uh, profound uh, respect for your contribution and, and hoping that you have many, many more years to celebrate with us each and every year during our summer conference. Carl Berger. Hi everybody. How are you? It is it is really a humbling honor to uh, to, to accept this award, uh, particularly from this group. Uh, I can remember, in fact, when we sat out in the audience uh, listening to a woman, Kimberly Jenkins was her name. She was running a project called Highway One, which was designed back in 1994 to educate members of Congress and the Senate in using these things called microcomputers. Do any of you remember microcomputers? Right? Okay. Well, you remember that. It was an interesting time when we formed this group because it was one of those wonderful times when industry and, and education got together. Actually, it was driven somewhat from industry uh, because uh, we wanted to see a change. We wanted to see a stronger cooperation among industry and, and education and, 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 and across the broad fields of education as, as Larry has, has taken the group. And, and that was a vision that came about and it just grew and it grew naturally and it's changed its form over time and it's, it's really gotten just wonderfully. As I, I saw the Adobe um, um, scenes up there that Adobe put together of these wonderful pioneers, I was marveling at, at how many of them still had a lot of hair. <laughs> That is certainly not true of all of us, as you can plainly see, but it did remind me of a couple of, of, of very, very fascinating things, and that is the, 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 the early times that we all had these wonderful dreams. I happened to work with a, a woman, Elizabeth Wood, of Bell Telephone Laboratories, who's the co-inventor of the um, picture telephone. I don't know if any of you ever saw a version of the early picture telephone about this big, marvelous thing. And everybody looked at it and said, well, I'm not so sure I want anybody to see me while I'm talking to them. Because when I talk to people, I generally don't look very good when I do that. And I contrast that at that time, and you can just see Doug Inbrook up there, where he had that early mouse in his hand made out of wood. Can you imagine a mouse made out of wood? You could probably go buy one now, but it wouldn't be like that. But now, last night was a wonderful example of the extension of the picture telephone as we smuggled into <laughs> last night's conference our own picture telephones and ran down the aisle <laughs> taking pictures so we could claim to the security that we didn't have cameras. <laughs> now I know that Elizabeth Wood would just love to see that just as Ingo Breath and, and all the others would have, have loved to see what has happened with the large cell phones like this down to the tiny cell phones like that. But it takes people that have vision that aren't, aren't us people without the hair. Because one of our biggest problems is we like to keep those early visions sacrosanct. We want to keep that early technology the way it is. Why shouldn't a cell phone be as big as a cell phone should be? 
Why do you have these tiny little cell phones? Why, in fact, are they so small that today you see people walking down the street talking to themselves? <laughs> in any event, it takes a different kind of vision. It takes the kind of vision that you folks have that kind of vision that exists in each and every one of you. It takes the Lewis King of the world to come in and build a new media center out of a high school auditorium gymnasium. Would you believe that? He built our new media center out of that. Now, it's not the same one that you saw in the pictures up there. That's a little bit larger, but he did it. He was the one that had that vision at that time, and he's keeping that vision. You're taking our vision. You're changing our vision. That's the joy of this organization. That's what makes this organization one of the most fascinating organizations. The neatest thing about it is that we have various serious business at hand. The stuff we're doing is serious because it is going to change the lives of the students in the future. It's changing their lives right now. That's serious business. But the joy of this organization is that we don't take ourselves seriously. Did you know last night, last night, the joy that we all had when we saw our fearless leader actually doing the ultimate rock and roll thing by actually being tossed off the stage? <laughs> you see that? Wasn't that wonderful? I think that just epitomizes the rebelliousness of this group. Of course, he told me later that they continued their escapades until they had to close down his hotel room last night. But we will let him tell about that. In any event, I thank you, thank you so much for this honor. I take it humbly. I only wish I could be here for another 20 years, and I think I'll try <laughs> to come back and see the rest of you having less or grayer hair. Thank you very much. Did everyone get a ticket? No.
the suspense. Okay, let me talk about some of the things that are tonight. I think that's good. Yeah. So uh, as we're getting the last tickets out, let me make a couple of announcements about tonight. Um, there is an event at the Museum of Contemporary Art from 6 to 8. There's a fantastic new show there that everybody's invited to. It's free. There's information in your program about that. Um, and so I encourage you to think about that. Immediately following this event is the NMC Partner Showcase, which includes uh, food and beverage. It's right down the hall. It's actually the same room where we were in for the opening reception. That'll be right after this. And then later tonight, in this same room, from 8 to 10, is uh, the NMC Second Life uh, Rollout and Beer Bash, um, which is kind of a blue jeans and t-shirt affair. Uh, and we're going to have the um, creators of the NMC campus here from Electric Sheep Company. Uh, we'll do a little demo, and you have a chance to talk to them. And so that ought to be actually pretty much fun. We're going to do a live event in both Second Life and here uh, on in the uh, in the auditorium. So, all right. So we still got a couple of people over here. Yeah, we are getting closer. I only see three hands up, and there's one. Right there, Rachel's getting her. One up there. Okay, so now we'll tell you we're, what we're giving away are drink tickets to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. <laughs> oh yeah, and we have some tickets to the opening reception as well. That's true, I forgot about those, Peggy, that's pretty cool. Okay. Did we miss anybody? After all that, I think I need to give a lot more away. Huh? All right, so Larry mentioned, you know, that Adobe's gone through a little transition this past year. Uh, Adobe and Macromedia, one company now. We haven't changed the branding yet, but it is Adobe. The first prize, I joked about this last year at the conference that I was gonna give away Dreamweaver. And now I get to give away Dreamweaver. <laughs> we have a few more. A few more? Oh, they're coming. They're okay. coming. Get them in quick. All right, so the drawing is closed. <laughs> we have to do that at trade shows all the time. Those last minute stragglers. Okay, for the first drawing, a copy of Studio 8. Let's let Muhammad pick. Muhammad picks. Would you do us the honors, please? Get the glasses out. 368 <coughs> 367012. Oh, we have a winner. <laughs> Next up, copy of Creative Suite Premium. Oh, there's the box. If the ver uh, it, we have, um, I'm not sure if we have a Mac or Windows version, but we can flip it out depending on what you need. <laughs> Not yet. Three six eight seven zero six eight. Woo! <laughs> okay, we're gonna do one more. This will have to ship to you because we didn't bring it. How about a copy of the new Adobe Creative Suite Production Studio? That's Windows only.
Thanks, everyone. Look forward to seeing you at the exhibitors event from 4 to 6. All right, and now it's time for something really fun. It's the five minutes of fame, which, as you may know or should know, is an NMC tradition that goes way back to the beginning, or almost. It's going to be fast, it's going to be fun, and you're going to see a lot of edgy technologies. This is not your run-of-the-mill stuff. We have 10 contestants here. Unfortunately, uh, Dave Fleischer, the 11th one, is not available. And they're each going to have five minutes to tell you about an interesting technology that uh, they have to show for us. And the catch is, if they don't finish in five minutes, our guest gonger, Wendy Shapiro, <laughs> is going to bang that big gong, and they have to stop. Can we? Let's give it a go. <laughs> Woo! OK, hello, everyone. I'm very pleased uh, to be here this afternoon to share with you a very simple idea that we designed at the Center for Learning Technologies, Old Dominion University, uh, as a production unit and a faculty development unit. We receive a large number of syllabi from faculty. And one thing we noticed is there are a lot of inconsistencies, a lot of differences. We have wide range from two pages to 25 pages. And of course, that poses some issues in terms of, in terms of quality. So we thought that what was the most efficient and easy way for us to help faculty ensure some level of consistency and the quality across the board, we came with the idea of a syllabus generator system. Basically, as if, we, if we keep in mind that the syllabus itself is the most important document that the faculty member shares with the student, then, of course, the implication of having uh, an incomplete syllabus might have issues in terms of uh, student frustration, a l n large number of questions, and even in some cases teaching effectiveness. We considered a very simple process, straightforward process, in which we wanted to streamline the, uh, the creation process of, of syllabi, and we considered this idea or metaphor, if you want, the syllabus creation life cycle, where we help faculty review, prepare this, the syllabus, create, export, reuse, and share. So based on this life cycle approach, we created the following. Uh, let me log in so I can actually. OK, so I'm, I'm already logged in. Basically, as a faculty member, when I log in, I log in here, and they have, I have a series of steps that I need to go through. The first one, of course, is to have a title for my syllabus. So in this case, if I go just with test, and then the call number in this case would be, for example, 101. And I click continue. The next step, of course, here for me as a faculty member that I will be able to, I have a lot of pre-configured and pre-filled in sections. OK. <laughs> Let me make another mistake. Oops, the call number, yeah. OK, so I have actually here basically some of the information is already pre-filled. Based on my, my profile, our information is automatically entered there. And uh, the, the interesting thing is to, to give faculty flexibility to adapt what they are doing. They can edit, they can remove, they can, depending on what they are doing actually, to, uh, they can enable, rename the categories. So for example, if I want to uncheck the office location, all I have to do is then check this. If I want to rename it, I click on rename, and it's an easy step. Then I continue. And I have a series of other sections. For example, the help desk website is already there. The Blackboard website is already there. The faculty feedback, the faculty evaluation system. So all the usual stuff that some faculty have tendency to forget are pre-filled in, in this environment. And then I can continue, actually. The interesting part of this is the, the schedule creation. As we all know, the schedule sometimes can be very time consuming. We all know, for example, as faculty, you, you spend a lot of time just figuring out the dates and the day when you are completely done with your, with your copies, you notice that the date is incorrect, so you have to start over. Uh, this system, basically what it does, you select the number of weeks that you are teaching. So for example, if I'm teaching a summer session with seven weeks, then I have to do to select that and then the date. So if I, for example, it's starting uh, June 12th, then I have to check the date. 
and then click on create, and automatically it will generate a schedule for me where I have the week, the day, the date, the topics, the assignment, and the due date. And as I go through, I can add topic. So for example, if the first one is to read the syllabus or the course introduction, I complete the sections, and automatically I have the flexibility to add, remove as many topics as I want. Uh, when I click on save, continue, I have the rest of the sections basically just some additional information and more importantly the university policies because very often it's very time consuming for faculty to go find out for example the university email policy. So what they have to do is already pre-filled in all they have to do is to select that and it's there. So basically at the end completely as you can see it's a very comprehensive checklist. The assumption here is a student centered so there are a lot of, a lot of assumption in terms of the overall design of the, of the product but at the end completely continue and the interesting thing is the last step in this process. So if I click on continue, I have the option to save the file as PDF, Word document, or HTML. I can also email it to myself or to anyone interested in it. And when I am done completely, I can actually, for example, let's assume that I'm teaching the same course the following year. Boom. <laughs> Let's hear from Ma Mohammed Abdu from Al Old Dominion University. Next up, we're going to hear from Joe DeFazio from Indiana University, who will tell us about enhancing the message in new media. Well, this is going to be uh, uh, a technique used to bind a work together in a coherent whole, or can be found in uh, form classical music, video scores, video games, popular music, literature, and drama. Uh, this technique was started by Carl Maria von Weber, used by Richard Wagner in his four cycle operas, used by John Williams in many film scores, Alan Silvestri in his film scores, Nobo Umatsu in many of his Final Fantasy soundtracks, used by Nine Inch Nails um, on their Downward Spiral album, used by James Joyce in the Sirens chapter of Ulysses. It's printed in the bulletin and the handout that you've got, but if you know the technique, yell it out. Uh, sorry, I have no control over that, but that's not that's not the answer. But anyhow, I'll move on. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, first.